I also want to point out that when you look at screening, you have to look at long-term outcomes. I'm showing you here the results of ERSPC at 11, 13, and 16 years, and the Gothenburg trial at 14 and 18 years, and you see that the number to screen and diagnose to avoid one death improves significantly over time. So when you talk about screening, you have to look at the long-term impact uh, of this intervention. Uh, you know, I, I saw the uh, yesterday someone showed uh, the, the results from uh, uh, interviews with family practitioners about screening, what cut points to use. It doesn't surprise, the, the results didn't surprise me at all because if you look at the AUA, the task force, ACS, NCCN, you'll see the target population that shifts a bit uh, uh, and when they discourage testing and importantly, when to biopsy. Many guidelines do, do not include uh, when to biopsy and how to biopsy, especially the AUA and the task force. Uh, this is a problem. This is the Achilles heel of uh, PSA screening. So you take a, it's a pictogram of 1,000 U.S. men. So if you screen 1,000 U.S. men with PSA, about 250 will have an elevated PSA. If you biopsy all those patients, about half don't have disease. So they didn't need the, they didn't need the biopsy. Of the remaining half who have cancer, about 30 to 40 percent have low risk disease, and we could argue did not need to be detected. And then, if you look at downstream effects of overtreatment, uh, sepsis, and the number of uh, uh, deaths avoided, uh, you'll see that this is not a good value proposition for medicine. So we went when I first came into urology, we detected all, we treated all. The 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 era of active surveillance, Lori Klotz and I are here together, was to detect all and treat some. And now, as David mentioned yesterday, we're in the era where we'll detect some and treat some. Uh, so for NCCN, which I think is the second most used guidelines compared to the task force across the US, it continues to support early detection efforts in well-informed men. We believe in baseline testing at agent 45. A baseline test at 45 is a very strong predictor of the future risk of prostate cancer and the risk of lethal disease. Uh, germline testing, as you'll hear more about, uh, and we acknowledge that the optimal screening of high-risk patients, again, men with a strong family history, African-American men, is not completely known because they make up a very small proportion of men in the randomized trials. Uh, and it provides two alternatives to routine biopsy in men with an elevated PSA. And very importantly, you cannot screen you cannot screen if you do, do not understand that, in fact, surveillance is a, a very important option for men with low-risk disease. Uh, uh, I think in a meeting here about four or five years ago, Bob uh, Donahue took a port uh, NCCN guidelines. I listened to this. You can actually find it online. I, don't, I like him a lot, but I don't think his criticism was very good. There actually it's only four pages. So it's, a, it's only four pages. It, it is backed by a very long reference list. and. and um, uh, if you want to get all into the details of screening, it's a good resource to go to. It shows that, again, a baseline screening at age 45, an elevated PSA should be confirmed. So what are some of the co controversies? Well, one of the controversies is a digital rectal examination. Digital rectal examination should not be used as a standalone screening test. It's poorly implemented in the community. Its positive predictive value uh, is actually quite low. And I see it as a complementary test to, to, to PSA. So if you have an elevated PSA, a suspicious DRE is associated with a higher risk of higher grade disease. And I think it should be done on all men uh, with the with, uh, with the elevated PSA. I don't believe that it could be implemented in a, in a, in a nationwide screening program well. Um, again, if you have an elevated PSA, you can go ahead to a biopsy, but nowadays, in fact, I think most of us are going to a test of specificity. And by test of specificity, I mean the biomarker or MRI. And there's a consensus now that adding MRI to targeting increases detection of high-risk cancers. The negative predictive value of an MRI is about 85%, so it's not a good standalone screening tool. So if you have a negative MRI, you need something else, a biomarker to make a decision not to screen. Um, I think it, it is consensus that at least the first biopsy, both MRI and systematic biopsy, should be done. Now, over time, we have some evidence that certainly in the surveillance population, targeting biopsy may be adequate. There's variation expertise and availability, and there's no comprehensive economic analysis completed in the U.S. on this. Uh, Lori's here, a high-resolution micro-ultrasound may perform as well as, uh, as multiparametric MRI. Again, the negative predictive value uh, of uh, negative MRI at UCSF is around 84%. It was 76% in the PROMISE trial. So again, a negative MRI alone is not adequate. Recent trial in New England Journal, again, shows that by using MR-targeted biopsies, you decrease the likelihood of detecting uh, uh, negative biopsy or benign biopsy. I want to point out that even when you use these biomarkers or MRI, the, the patients you identify, at least 30% of them have low-risk disease. So again, you don't get rid of, uh, of low-risk disease 
uh, you try and decrease its incidence. A lot of biomarkers here, a few have head-to-head -head comparisons. The optimal aura test is not known. Uh, as I'll show you, recent studies suggested an upfront biomarker testing with conditional MRI may be the most efficient way to go about uh, early detection. And you'll reduce biopsies by somewhere between 20 and 65% and miss relatively few high-grade cancers. These are some algorithms we've shown at UCSF recently, uh, upfront MRI followed by 4K testing. Again, uh, upfront MRI, you'll reduce biopsies uh, by about uh, 7 to 17 percent. So baseline, uh, starting with an MRI first, you, you, you don't uh, uh, decrease the number of uh, biopsies as much as you'd like to. Uh, other way around, upfront liquid biomarker, I'm just showing you who, two here, either 4K or exosome DX. I think they all perform relatively well. By using an upfront biomarker, you'll miss few high-grade cancers, and you'll reduce biopsies by about uh, 39 to 43 percent. So again, it looks as though this might be a better way to go. Uh, and this just shows you the, the, the number of biopsies avoided by any uh, single uh, algorithm. Uh, so I think when you come time to do a biopsy again, I think an MRI is quite reasonable to do. I just want to point out here a couple of things on, on pathology. Uh, introductal carcinoma and atypical introductal proliferation, these are bad, uh, these are bad uh, histologies. Also, it's very important, and I don't know that it'll be ta talked about in, the, uh, in this meeting, is the histologic subtype of pattern four is a very important predictor of outcome. So nowadays, when you get the uh, grade back, you want your pathologist to tell you whether or not this is simple cribriform, uh, uh, expansile cribriform, uh, fused glands, but the subtype of pattern four correlates with genomic testing as a predictor of, uh, of outcome and treatment selection. So in summary, prostate cancer early detection in well-informed men saves lives. One could argue about how many men it sa lives it saves. Optimal screening of those at risk, African-American men, strong family history, those with high germline mutations is unknown. Again, we recommend that those patients start uh, early detection efforts in their early 40s. PSA should be confirmed and direct examination be, should be uh, performed in men with an elevated PSA. I believe the test of specificity should be considered in those who, who wish to avoid a biopsy, but recognize that access to biomarkers and MRI expertise may be quite variable across the U.S. And again, I want to state that active surveillance is a per preferred option for men with low and very low risk disease. And again, as we'll talk about in this, some men with uh, favorable intermediate risk disease. Thank you very much.